All right, we'll begin today with a uh, homework review in just a moment. I should probably grab a, a, a homework thing here to go over. But first, um, as I was grading uh, papers from previous assignments, I noticed that some of you struggled um, with what's called a rhetorical question. And it's a little bit difficult to understand in English, but it happens all over the place in both the Old and New Testaments. So I thought it'd be worth it to break it down. I'm specifically referring to um, the parable in Luke 15 that was due last week. If you remember that far back, you had the parable of the lost sheep, followed by the parable of the lost coin, followed by the parable of the lost son with the two brothers and, and all that stuff. We kind of went into detail on that. Um, and Jesus, uh, he, when he begins these, these, this series of parables, he says to the audience, he says, which of you would not, I'm paraphrasing, but it's which of you would not go to find your lost sheep, right? It's actually something like which one of you having 100 sheep, if uh, you lose one, would not leave the 99 in the open field and go search for the one that is lost. But essentially he's saying, which of you would not go find your lost sheep? And some of you thought that that's what Jesus was that Jesus was saying, you would not go find your lost sheep, which I understand why you would think that, because Jesus literally says, you would not go find your lost sheep. Um, but this is in the context of a rhetorical question. And so in asking, which of you would not go find your lost sheep, he's actually saying, of course, you would go find your lost sheep. This is such an obvious conclusion that I can phrase it as a question, and, uh, and the answer would be, well, of course I would go and look for the lost sheep. Um, in Minnesota, we have a similar question that gets asked a lot. Don't you know? Right? Don't you know? If you, yeah. If you, if you say something obvious and then you end it with don't you know, uh, the question, don't you know, the obvious answer is, well, of course I know. Um, because it's an obvious thing, you know, and and so, uh, you know, that's, <laughs> I guess, uh, outside of Minnesota, we just say, you know, uh, but it's the same thing. It's a little rhetorical question that, um, that it, you know, the answer is supposed to be obvious, but the Bible uses this sort of phrasing a lot, and it's, um, it's, it's supposed to emphasize the, the hopefully obvious truth that's being stated there. But a lot of times it emphasizes that truth by negating it, by saying no, when the answer is so obviously yes that, um, you know, the ridiculousness of the no is, is supposed to highlight the obvious yes. So that probably just made it a bit more confusing, but I hope you can at least see this equation that's supposed to be an equal sign, this equation that I wrote on the board there. I'll leave that up as we go through our homework here. So our homework for today, uh, we were reading various uh, accounts of Jesus performing miracles. And the first one comes from Luke chapter 17. So if you had any questions on the homework or just want to follow the discussion, I encourage you to open your Bibles first to Luke chapter 17. Um, so that's where Jesus heals the ten lepers, right? And I give, I hope you read the little blurb I put there um, to give you some cultural context that um, people with leprosy, according to Jewish law, were ceremonially unclean. It's actually any skin condition that causes bleeding or oozing or something like that um, makes you ceremonially unclean. It's not a sinful state, um, but it is a hygiene issue. And the law says that if you um, have bodily fluid coming out of your skin, um, that you need to isolate yourself until, um, until it stops. And then once it's stopped, you have to wait an extra seven days and then go through ceremonial washing and then be declared clean by a priest who was basically kind of like a de facto doctor in those days. So it was, um, it was a matter of religious law and civil law, but it was also for the purpose of, um, of hygiene. And uh, of course, we uh, pandemic people know all about the value of quarantining. Uh, but if you have a condition like leprosy, that means you have constant, ongoing skin issues that will never be resolved. So, um, so you, as in essence, are are um, doomed to a life of isolation and uh, you know being cut off from the rest of society. So, having leprosy really, really stinks. And uh, I just wanted to emphasize that in my little blurb that I wrote in the assignment. Um, so that you can understand that these are not just guys who were healed of some little sickness. Uh, they, were, um, they were doomed to a miserable life. And, uh, but of course, um, there were ten lepers healed in the story, and only one returned to thank Jesus. 
So we often read the story on Thanksgiving Day um, because it, it, uh, it emphasizes how much Jesus values when we thank him for all of the good things that he gives us. Um, but then a question that I see at least two of you have struggled with is, uh, what made the thankful man well, according to Jesus? And uh, always remember that the verbs in my questions are designed to match the verbs in the Bible. So if we read Luke 17, it's probably going to be verse 19 here. Um, yeah, and Jesus said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. So what made the thankful man well? Your faith has made you well. It's the same, uh, same verb and adverb there. That was uh, actually, it's an adjective. Whatever, same verbs. I try to match the wording of uh, the Bible as much as I can in my questions because what I value most is that you have actually read the Bible. And uh, so I, I try to avoid questions with um, in-depth comprehension. I just kind of want you to be able to prove to me that you've read your Bible. <laughs> The next one is um, Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. That's the story where um, Jesus is in a very crowded house, and there's a poor guy who's paralyzed, whose buddies want to get him to Jesus to be healed, um, but they couldn't get close to him. So what do they do? Who remembers? What do they do? They cut a hole in the roof. Yeah, isn't that something? Um, now, roofs in those days were um, not quite the elaborate affairs that they are today. So it's not like they did $30,000 of damage to somebody's house, um, but they did something very unusual anyway. They removed the roof and uh, lowered the guy down right onto Jesus um, with ropes. And uh, let's see here. What did the paralyzed man's friends do when they couldn't bring him to Jesus? Yep, opened a roof made an opening for him. What did Jesus do first before healing the man? Ella? Right. So this is in Mark chapter 2, uh, beginning at verse 1. Let me turn my page there and, and fast forward it to there. Uh, they made an opening, verse 5. They lowered him down. Jesus saw their faith. He said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And by all appearances, that was all Jesus intended to do, was just forgive this poor guy his sins. Um, but, verse 6, some of the scribes were sitting there. Um, I should note that um, in the gospel accounts, there are a lot of religious guys that tend to be bad guys, um, even though in reality, they are seen as good guys. Or I shouldn't say in reality. By their peers, um, they are seen as good guys. Um, they are the scribes, the Pharisees, uh, the teachers of the law, of the law. Um, the law, remember we talked last week about that word Torah. Um, it's usually translated as law, but it actually is just referring to the first five books of the Bible, which um, in our Lutheran understanding are just as much gospel, if not more so, uh, as they are law. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so teachers of the law would be like you know, the people in church, it's usually me who leads Bible study. Um, but the people in church who, who uh, are authorized to lead Bible study, kind of like our elders. Um, but then also Pharisees would be like that. Scribes are people who study the Bible and copy the Bible. Um, you remember, they don't have copy machines in those days. So if you want to disseminate the Bible, you have to do it by hand. And if it is your job to copy the Bible by hand, you are going to naturally become very familiar with what it teaches. So the scribes have a lot of religious authority in Jesus' day. And so these are people who know God's word, who go to church every Sunday or every Saturday, as the case is with the Jews. Um, uh, they're good guys, and yet they are always butting heads with Jesus, it seems. And so also here... The scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, so that gets to uh, question six. Why were the Jewish scribes upset that Jesus was forgiving sins? And um, I would have accepted he's blaspheming. Or also they go on to ask, who can forgive sins but God alone? And their concern is valid, you know, um, if, if, uh, if I um, throw rocks at Ivy's car and uh, break all of her windows, and Ivy's really mad at me because I broke all of her windows and threw rocks at her car, and then Elliot comes up and says, it's okay, Pastor, Ivy forgives you. Um, Elliot doesn't have the right to do that. That would make Ivy very mad. Be like, well, what do you, I, I don't forgive him. 
who the heck are you to tell him that that I for, I don't you know that you're just some idiot so uh, um, yeah uh, that's what the scribes are saying your sins offend God and now this guy this random you know so-called teacher is telling a man that God forgives his sins he he doesn't have that authority you know he's not God he's just a man and so because they think this um, and Jesus, immediately perceiving in his spirit, they questioned within themselves, said, which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? But to show you that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, right? So the whole question is, is Jesus allowed to forgive sins? And Jesus says, well, you know, it's easy to say your sins are forgiven, but is it easy to make a guy stand up and walk? So he does. He says, rise, take up your mat, and walk. And he does. The paralyzed man is healed uh, miraculously by divine power, of course, and he uh, takes up his mat and, and goes home. But the whole reason Jesus does this miracle is not out of pity on the paralyzed man, but rather to prove to those seeing there that he has authority to forgive sins. That just as God has given him the power to heal the lame, so also God has given him the power to forgive sins. And, uh, and so that's kind of where I was leading you with these questions. Um, they thought only God could forgive. Who alone is able to do miracles like healing? God. And then next, why would Jesus' miracles show the scribes that he also has authority to forgive sins? Because just as only God can miraculously heal a paralyzed guy, so also only God can forgive sins. If you have authority to do one, it is a very strong evidence that you have authority to do the other. The last one we looked at was Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. Um, uh, let's see, what's that one? Ah, yes, healing of a man with a demon. Um, so I asked you to name three things that the unclean spirit caused the possessed man to do. Um, this, again, is just a test that you actually um, read the text. So what do we got there? There, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs. No one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. So, looks like he can break chains. He'd often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart. He broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Um, so, I don't know, you could say fought people who subdued him. There's a bunch here. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out, cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him, crying out with a loud voice. He said, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by the son of God, do not torment me. So um, all of those things were things that the unclean spirit caused the man to do. So pick your three favorite verbs, um, you know, throw them in with some context, and there you go. Uh, number 10 was a gimme. This unclean spirit obviously had great power over all the men who tried to contain him. Does he seem to have any power over Jesus? No. The answer is no. no. Yeah. Oh, hey, Andrew. I see you come in there. <laughs> and now I've drawn attention to you. Sorry. I have a bad habit of doing that. Uh, last question. A lot of people think that God and the devil, this is a comprehension question, but I hope you, you uh, were led to this conclusion. A lot of people think that God and the devil are two equal and opposite powers that are just locked in an endless battle, right? You've probably seen that personification somewhere on the way. The devil is a leader of all the forces of evil, and God is a leader of all the forces of good, and they are just locked in this terrible conflict that plays out in humanity and all of that. What does this passage tell us about who is really the stronger of the two? It's you know, Andrew? Uh, it's God. Right. Yeah, who are one and the same. Yeah, it's, it's uh, God the Father, God the Son. It's God is stronger. Uh, there's not even a question. As Martin Luther famously wrote, uh, the devil may be the devil, but he's God's devil. Um, so God, the devil does not get to do anything that God does not permit him to do. Now that opens up all kinds of philosophical questions that are a little bit beyond the scope of this course, which is just to um, learn what the Bible says. Uh, so I'm going to let that rest for now. Uh, we're going to talk next year for you who are going to be third year students. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about deep questions like why does God allow bad things to happen uh, and stuff like that. Uh, that's that's uh, part of the uh, third year apologetics course that I'll be teaching next year to you uh, students who are in your second year this year.
You guys who are in your first year this year get to learn Luther's Catechism next year. And then on the foundation of God's Word, the Bible, and Luther's Catechism, which is also basically founded on the Bible, uh, with that firm foundation, you will then be better equipped to answer the tough questions. But for now, go ahead and crack open your workbooks to Lesson 24. That's going to be on page 97. We get to break through to page 100 today. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. So, um, and then uh, if you want to pull out your Bibles here, almost everything we discussed today is going to be from Luke chapter 22. Um, we're basically like, yeah, just uh, spend a whole day in a single chapter of Scripture, and we will still barely scratch the surface because the Bible is an incredible book, and, uh, and that's just how it is. But... Um, yeah, for ease of use today, go ahead and open your Bible to Luke 22. We'll make a few diversions from this passage, but by and large, this is where we will be living today. Today, we're going to talk about Jesus' passion. What comes to mind when you hear the word passion? Caring. Caring, okay. That's kind of compassion, which is obviously related, but yeah, passion. A strong feeling about something, right. It's uh, frequently used in the realm of love and all of that, right? You feel a, a very, uh, you share a passionate kiss with someone you love. Um, you know, that's not, that's not something that happens between a mother and a child. That's, that's uh, in the throes of romance and all of that the stuff that makes you kind of gag a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, um, passion is a very, very strong emotion. Um, so the week or so leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus is often called the Passion. And this is not a week in the church year, although it, we do observe it the week before Easter. Um, but this is a literal week in history uh, that began on a Sunday uh, with Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We call that Palm Sunday. And, uh, and then the week ends on Good Friday where Jesus dies and then goes to Easter Sunday where Jesus rises again. So that week from Palm Sunday to, um, to the death of Jesus on Good Friday is kind of collectively called Jesus' Passion. And although we use that word in a lot of different ways, it can be best defined as strong emotions. Good job, Addison. Um, as Jesus went to the cross, he experienced suffering for us. Let's take a look at these important events and what they mean for us. Yeah, so, um, so you know, we've got your timeline at the bottom of the page there. There have been sessions of this class where we have covered 400 plus years in one hour. Yeah. Um, today, today we're going to cover a week. <laughs> so we're really yeah. kind of pumping the brakes on our movement through history. Why? Because this is important. We are going to be spending three class sessions on Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection. Um, so yeah, if you think a week is a short amount of time for one class, next week we're going to be looking at one day, basically. Um, the day of Jesus' death. But for now, was that? Yeah, well, it's, it's uh, pretty important there. I just had a realization I might not hit record. Nope, I hit record. Very good. Okay, so Luke 22, go ahead and turn to page 98 in your workbook there. Next page. Um, so pages 98 and 99 are a two-page spread. So I invite you to open up so that you can see both pages at the same time because um, that's how these two pages are designed to be experienced. I'll read at the top there, and then I'm going to be looking for some volunteers uh, to read from Luke 22. So get ready for that. Um, Actually, the first one will be from Luke 19. So if any uh, brave soul wants to turn to Luke 19, I'm already that's where there, we'll start. So awesome. Congratulations. Passion Luke Week, 20 top 20 of page 98. Um, the last week of Jesus' life, which Christians around the world remember as Passion Week, is really important to understanding the narrative of salvation. In it, we start to see how Jesus fulfills all of God's promises from the Old Testament and also how he sets up our lives as New Testament people today. For this lesson, we'll track some of the events in the last week of Jesus' life before his crucifixion by using a map of Jerusalem at the time. Now, that's kind of a fun way to do it. Um, that map is found at the top of page 99. So have a look at that. For this activity, follow the numbers on the map, starting with 1. 
Read and reflect on that event and then trace a line on the map to the next number following the path that Jesus and his disciples may have taken during this time. Now, there are like three or four days between one and two, uh, but you can draw a line from one to two anyway. That's, uh, that's good enough. Uh, so anyway, uh, who can find the number one on the map? What is it next to? Golden Gate. The Golden Gate, yes. Not, not to be confused, the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Um, and right next to the map, we have uh, item number one, Jesus enters Jerusalem. Note how the road there is kind of squiggly by the Golden Gate. Any idea why the road is uh, winding back and forth? Andrew? Because it's so like farmer packed that it's kind of like, it's not just a straight line to there. And so they don't be like the simple way back there. So you think there might be walls between the, the squiggles yeah, then? Or something like that? Because I mean, the army's going to go across yeah. the lawn yeah. if, mm -hmm. uh, if they want to get to the city. Yeah, that's a good guess. Um, and the, the real reason is close to that, at least it's part of the reason why Jerusalem is such a well-defended city. Um, that road is winding up a very steep hill. If you were to try to go straight up that hill, you would have to like climb with your hands and, and feet and stuff. Not a very good look for um, horses and wagons and you know uh, movement of goods. So instead they have the road uh, wind slowly upward back and forth because that is, uh, that's what's needed to get a, a cart up the hill there. So it does make it a very militarily defensible position, um, but it's not because of walls or keep off the grass. It's, um, it's because Jerusalem, remember, is situated at the top of a mountain. Uh, the mountain is called Mount Zion. And specifically, the temple is at the tippy top of that mountain. And as you can see from the map there, um, the, the golden gate by which Jesus enters Jerusalem is right by the temple. So... He's kind of coming in the steep way, if you will, uh, hence the windingness. All right, uh, so looking at number one there, we're going to read from Luke 19 in just a moment. After Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, you guys remember learning that last week, I hope. That was in John chapter 11. Um, it was a whole funeral, shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept, uh, etc. Um, after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he entered in, into Jerusalem for the last time on Sunday, the first day of the week. Read or listen to Luke, 20, or Luke 19, verse 28 to 40. In a few words or sketches, what would this scene have looked like? So, uh, Braden, are you ready to read for us? Luke, Luke 19, starting at verse 28. Um, to 40, I believe. It's 12 verses. You can handle it. 13 verses, excuse me. You can still handle it. Go ahead. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near Beth... Bethphage. Beth Beth or Beth you can call it Bethphage, but a lot of people don't like that fog syllable, so you can call it Bethphage. Bethphage. <laughs> and Bethany at the moment that is called Olivet. He said the Mount, that's called Olivet, yep. He sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a coat tied on which no one has ever sat. Oh my! <laughs> Tie it and bring it to me. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away. Went away. And, and All right. And they're laughing. Stop so laughing, girl. She's I'm doing a good job. Laughing. Yeah, you're not laughing now because I'm turned around. All right. Compose yourself, Brayden. Go ahead. Deep breaths. No, I was laughing. Stop it. Read. Somebody else want to read? What yeah. verse do you end on? I don't even know. Some well coloring pictures. Brandon, what here. verse are you on? I'm on verse like 32. 32, I'll take it from there. <laughs> so those who were sent went away and found it, just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, 
the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Very good. Okay, so um, so here is my best attempt at drawing the situation. Since I emphasize the topography, I figured I would make it there too. So they actually start off over here because outside of Jerusalem, at the end of Squiggly Road, there is a valley, and on the other side of that valley is a, a garden with a bunch of olive trees and such. And the mountain is called Olivet because of all of the olive trees on it. Um, we'll come back to that mountain. We're not done with it. Um, but Jesus starts off up there. He sends his disciples ahead and says, hey, go get, go get a donkey. Um, and uh, he might have he had some supernatural foresight of this, or he might have just made arrangements with the guy. Uh, the text isn't really clear. But the disciples go in. They find a donkey. They bring him back to Jesus. And Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem on this donkey. Um, who knows why it's significant that he was riding a donkey? Riding in on a fancy horse, so it showed like the horse. That's what I'm looking for, and I can't find it. Am I on the right track, at least? You're on the right track, yeah, yeah. So there is a definite contrast of Jesus riding in on a donkey instead of on a horse. And the, uh, the contrast is this um, people, when a king is riding in to conquer a city, he rides in on a horse. You wet yourself? He rides. You. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. When a king is riding in to conquer a city, um, he rides in on a horse, right? That is a kind of a, not so much a declaration of war, but a declaration of victory. But if a king enters a city on a donkey, donkeys are not tools of war. Donkeys are like, they're beasts of burden. Um, that means you don't come for war, you come in peace. You come uh, perhaps for trade or, or just for travel or something. But, uh, but to enter on a donkey instead of a horse is sending a nonverbal message that, um, that I'm coming not to conquer Jerusalem, um, but uh, I come in peace. Andrew? I thought horses were like invented in like Mexico and then they did... Did they have them back then? Um, they did. They had horses back then. Yeah, they're in the Old Testament all over. Um, they weren't invented in Mexico. Um, I, I wasn't prepared to discuss North American history today. Um, I, I, I want to say that they were brought over from Europe and, um, and were bred in, in Mexico. They were brought over with the, explore, the conquistadors who went to South America. And uh, that's kind of where horses were brought into the North American continent, and the natives uh, quickly found a lot of use for them, and, and the, their usage spread from there. And so, uh, so, yeah, when the Americans, centuries later, were trying to conquer Mexico, they had to deal with mounted natives, um, but that was, that was in large part because the mounts had been brought over from Europe. I'm pretty sure that's the story, but I'm not an expert in North American history, and have not read anything about it in the last, you know, month or two. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, uh, I make no claims to authority. But anyway, so Jesus is coming into Jerusalem here, and he's greeted by a huge crowd, way more than two people, but we've only got like half an hour left here. And, um, and they are waving palm branches and laying them on the road, which is why we call it Palm Sunday, right? You guys... Familiar with the phrase Palm Sunday? Oh. Any of you who went to church a couple Sundays ago when we observed it, um, we started worship out here in this room, and we held uh, palm fronds, and we waved palm branches, and we had a, a bit in the liturgy where we said Hosanna in the highest, and we waved our palm branches, and yeah, we were kind of uh, symbolically joining Jesus' followers in Jerusalem who uh, celebrated. And, um, you know, not being a very rich operation, they did not have a literal red carpet to roll out for them. So they, they put palm branches on the road. Um, they put their cloaks on the road. And in those days, people, you know, in addition to your T-shirt and shorts, your tunic, if you will, they also wore a cloak over themselves. And so they took off their cloaks and laid them down for Jesus to ride over. Um, so kind of a small sacrifice of your cloak, uh, at least of its cleanliness, uh, for the in order to pave the way for your Savior. So Jesus had lots of followers, and they were very happy to see him. Elliot? So would, like, their cloak be 
you like like the one two arm model sweatshirts that we wear? Um, I mean, it's a really warm country, so our sweatshirts are designed to keep us warm. Their cloaks are actually designed to protect them from the sun, and uh, and they're very um. What's the word I'm looking for? They, they allow air to pass through. They breathe really well. Um, so the, the cloaks, I'm not going to say they're designed to keep you cool, but they are designed to protect you from the sun while not making you overly hot. So not as expensive as a modern day um, winter coat, but you're on the right track. As far as fashion goes, uh, your cloak was worn over your clothes. So we didn't have a bunch of people stripping down to their skivvies so that they can throw clothes in front of Jesus. Um, that was just there cloaks uh let's see here talk about what you think people were looking for in jesus why do you think so many people were so happy to see jesus coming andrew because they knew he was their savior and they knew because he was their savior. knew he was their savior yes i'm not so sure about that second point that they knew he would save them from their sins we'll come back to that isaac you said something yeah, you were like, it's because he's awesome or something, but I didn't hear what you said. Because he's the best. Because he's the best. Yeah, sure. They like him. Um, uh, but I'm asking, why do they think he's the best? Why do they like him? Um, they do recognize him as a savior, but remember the political situation at this time. He's entering in a, into a city, the capital city of the Jews, but do the Jews actually own and rule the city? No. Who, who rules the city? The Romans do. No, the, the Roman Empire. The Jews are the band of, uh, of scrappy rebels who want to fight against the oppressive Roman Empire. It's, it's a Star Wars story. They're even in the desert, like Tatooine, you know? Um, but, uh, but at least that's how the Jews see themselves. They do not like these Roman oppressors who do not add to their society, but instead extract taxes as a tribute um, so that they're funding the stupid Roman Empire that's like halfway across the world from them. And, um, and th their only benefit is that the Roman Empire doesn't come in and kill them all. Um, spoiler alert, the Roman Empire does come in and kill them all about uh, 40 years after these events. Um, but, uh, and that's what the Pharisees are trying to avoid when they put Jesus to death. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So the people were definitely expecting a savior. Um, but they were probably more expecting a savior who would unite the people, raise an army, and throw off the oppression of the evil uh, Roman Empire. And Jesus is not about that, hence why he's coming in on a donkey. I suspect the subtle messaging of coming in on a donkey might have been lost to the people. Um, perhaps they figured he was just a low-budget operation who couldn't afford a horse or a red carpet. So, well, let's use the donkey and throw down some palm branches. I don't know. I wasn't there. But, um, but anyway, yeah, the people were celebrating Jesus, but they maybe didn't quite understand what about Jesus they were celebrating. The next event we're going to talk about is number two, which is all the way back in the orange box on page 108. And on your map, it's all the way down in the, um, the southwest corner there. Actually, I'm not certain that the map is oriented where north is up. A lot of ancient maps were oriented where north, it, where um, where up is east, and uh, it's very hard to read a map that way when it's so ingrained in your head that what? up is north. I've tried. <laughs> east, south, Wait, west, so north. East, yeah. south, north. Um, uh, right? Well, it would it would be east south, is up east, and north west. is then. I mean, yeah. I don't know. Turn and face yeah. east, east, and east, south, north south, is going to be on your west, west and north. north. East, south, yeah. north, west. North is east, that south, okay. west. Don't, south, don't hurt yourselves. Uh, Just uh, find, find a compass rose on a map somewhere and turn your head sideways so that east is on top. And then take note of everything else. For goodness That's sake, north. don't try to do it here because Henning is crooked. It Just is. sit down. Well, the rose so, don't even go straight in Henning anyway. That, that weird crooked road actually goes straight east west. So I worry I yourself about that one. Sit down. All right. Number two, orange box, page 108. By Thursday, a lot had happened. Jesus had cleared the temple of money changers. That's a fun story that we don't get to talk about today. And he had spent a lot of time teaching. Uh oh, oh I gotta get my gun out. Yeah. <laughs> I heard a lot of noise. Over Someone's talking to Sean. Talk about Grandpa. Yeah. All right, anyway, she's talking about her grandpa. No, I'm not. Was he at Palm Sunday? No. Yeah, well, then don't talk about him. I don't talk about him. I'd be careful, Pastor. All right, all right, all right, quiet down, quiet down. 
By Thursday, a lot had happened. Jesus had cleared the temple of money changers, spent a lot of time teaching. He did not hang out in Jerusalem very often. Even though Jerusalem was the religious center of Israel, Jesus spent most of his time where? Somebody said it. Who said it? Galilee. Galilee. Very good. Was that you, Tyson, who whispered it? Yeah. Very good, yeah. And I'm not going to draw the map, but you know the map that I like to draw with the, you know, the Jordan Dead River and the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean and all that. Yeah, so Galilee is like up here, and Jerusalem is like down here, and there's a whole country between them. Who remembers what that country is called? No. Nice try, though. Yeah? The Assyrians? Nope. No. Samaria. Samaria. In order for Jesus to travel from Galilee to Jerusalem, he would have to go through Samaria or go around Samaria. A lot of people hated Samaritans so much they did that. Um, but yeah, so you got Galilee, Samaria, Jerusalem, or Judea, excuse me, that's where Jerusalem was. Um, but yeah, Jesus spent most of his time up in Galilee, kind of up in the boonies. Um, that's kind of like uh, the Messiah of America coming and hanging out in Henning, Minnesota, and uh, only going to Washington, D.C. like once a year, you know, where the actual seat of, of power is. Um, but uh, yeah, just to give you some idea there, that's where Jesus hung out. But he was in Jerusalem for now. He spent a lot of time teaching at the temple. Um, he brings that up later at his trial. He's like, I've been here all week, guys. I've been teaching in the temple. Why didn't you arrest me there if I'm, if I'm such a bad guy? But uh, yeah, by Thursday, though, a lot had happened. Thursday evening, Jesus had gone back to the upper room. Uh, that's where he ended up on Palm Sunday and was going to celebrate the Passover feast with his disciples. What's the Passover feast? It is the Lord's Supper, but it wasn't until this time. But it existed for like 2,000 years or 1,500 years. Wasn't it when, um, when they painted the, the uh, sheep's blood on their door so that they would have to pass? Very good. Yep. That was the original Passover was the 10th plague sent against Egypt when the Israelites were slaves there. God instructed the Israelites to slaughter a lamb and paint the lamb's blood on their doorposts. And then the angel of death would pass over the houses with lamb's blood on the doorposts and spare them from death. And so by sacrificing a lamb to God and covering their home with its blood, not covering, but I'm, I'm going somewhere here. By sacrificing a lamb of God and painting its blood over your home, you would be saved from death. Does this imagery sound familiar? Yeah, yeah that's, that's basically that's basically the message of Jesus, isn't it? It's your homework for tonight, so if you've already done it, then um, good for you. <laughs> Elliot? It had to be like an imported lamb or like one of the best lambs that you had, right? Yes, it had to be an unblemished lamb. Um, taken uh, had to be a year old I think unblemished so yeah uh, God doesn't want your second best stuff um, if you have a lamb that is crippled or sick and you know it's gonna die anyway um, don't don't give that to God <laughs> God wants your best um, there's actually provisions for that um, in, in the Exodus account if you if you're not from a family that farms or is rich and can't afford a lamb, then you are supposed to join with another household and either pool your resources or um, just share in their lamb. It was meant, and obviously implicit in, this, in that is that rich households need to be willing to open up to, to less fortunate people. Um, but yeah, everybody, uh, everybody's supposed to have a lamb sacrificed on their behalf. And uh, you know, there's a lot of blood in a lamb. You can paint quite a few doorposts with it. So, uh, so you can you can still go home at, after the feast, but anyway, um, they uh, yeah they kept this Passover feast in remembrance of that of that event for fifteen hundred years, and it was time to celebrate it again. I mean, it was like it's literally like how we celebrate Easter. Um, so let's read or listen to Luke twenty two verses one through six. It says one through three there, but we're gonna do one through six. Go ahead, Braden. Luke twenty two verses one through six. No cracking up this time. Unleavened bread, yep. Unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chef priest and the chief scribe, priest, chief priest <laughs> and the scribe were seeking how to put him to death for the fear of the people. The Satan, then Satan, Satan, yep, then Satan. Satan entered into Judas, called 
Iscariot. That's like his last name, Judas Iscariot. Who was one? Who was? Who was one of the number of twelve? He went away and con- conferred. Conferred with the two priests and officers how he might betray him to them, and they were glad and agreed him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. Very good. Um, so, yeah, how, I bet you didn't expect Satan to enter the story here. How was Satan at work here to bring about the death of Jesus? Yeah? He was telling, or he was like going to pay Judas to betray Jesus. Um, it's at, well, uh, he arranged, so in the, in the account, Jesus, or, sorry, in the account, Satan enters Judas so it's almost like demon possession, kind of. We don't know exactly how much influence Satan had over Judas. Um, Judas was not a very good guy even before this account. Um, but having entered Judas, G- Satan then gets Judas to crack a deal with the Jewish leaders, and they pay Judas. So Satan, you could say, arranges for Judas to get paid, um, but but really it's more like Judas arranges for Judas to get paid and Satan just kind of pulls Judas' strings or however you want to phrase it there um, to, to make that happen. But yeah, so, so um, Sat- er, Judas' betrayal is what ends up uh, getting Jesus captured. Jesus is off alone by himself. Nobody knows where he is except his, his 12 disciples. And Judas, being one of those 12, is able to lead a, a small army to capture Jesus. Question? Um, why was uh, Judas... Yeah, Judas, a uh, disciple, if he was not a very good guy, and like, betrayed Jesus. Well, Jesus picked him. That's um, that's really the end of the story. Jesus didn't always pick good guys. He didn't pick the brightest, the best, the, the most moral. Um, he didn't pick all the same kinds of guys either. Um, he had a lot of fishermen, so you kind of think that all of his disciples were fishermen, but they weren't. Uh, one of them was a tax collector, so he was kind of a sellout to the Roman Empire. Tax collectors were very unpopular. Uh, one of them was a zealot, which is like a Jewish revolutionary who is probably looking for a violent overthrow of the Roman government. Um, you know, that wasn't Jesus' purpose, but he called a guy named Simon the Zealot, and that's what the zealots were. And so, uh, so among them, he called Judas Iscariot. Now, Jesus knew from the beginning that it would be by Judas that he would be betrayed, but it's got to be by somebody, you know. That's, Jesus repeatedly refers to fulfilling all things. Um, the Old Testament prophesies that these things will happen to Jesus, and um, they've got to be fulfilled by somebody. And so Judas is the one by whom uh, these things are fulfilled. That does not absolve him of guilt. Just because God uses your evil for good does not mean that your evil is somehow less evil. Um, and Judas gets what's coming to him, but we'll find that out later. <clears throat> Um, but I do want you to note that um, just as Satan uh, in, used a created person to, um, to bring about death in the world, um, so also, if you remember way back in the story of Eden and the fall into sin, Satan uh, used a serpent to bring death and destruction into the world. Um, so, you know, that's, that's how Satan works. He, he does his thing uh, to bring death and destruction, but that's always his goal. Uh, we need to abbreviate our readings a bit, sorry. So we're going to jump where um, Jesus is celebrating the Passover with his disciples, and then we're going to start at chapter 22, verse 14, Luke twenty-two, fourteen, 14. And we'll go through um, verse 23. So who wants to read Luke 22, 14, 23? Andrew, I saw your hand first. Go ahead. And when the hour came, he reclined at table, and the apostles with him, and said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do, do this in remembrance of me. 
and likewise they come back here and say, hey, can you say, this stuff was poured out for you, for me, for me, for my bread. But behold, the hand of the Lord will betray me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but will be not known by whom he is betrayed. And mm-hmm. when and they began to question one another, which of them is it? Could it be who was going to do it? Very good. So Jesus does something kind of important there. Uh, what did Jesus do that is like really critical to our lives today in this passage? Andrew? Oh, he said that. The, he said that the bread was his body and the wine was his blood. Yeah. He said the bread was his, he said, take and eat, this is my body. Um, Luke doesn't record it quite the way we do it in church. There are four different accounts of Jesus instituting what we call the Last Supper. And, um, and the one that we, that we recite in church is the one that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, but all four of them say the same basic thing. Jesus gives them bread, says, this is my body. Uh, he gives them wine, says, this is my blood of the new covenant. Uh, Tyson? Yes. Yeah, well, I was going to I was going to draw some pictures of the last supper and then I realized that one of the most famous pictures ever drawn depicts the last supper. So I decided to point the camera over what? there to the thing. Um, you guys who are here should be the ones who care the least about where the camera's pointed on account of, you know, you're here. I assume you don't watch these videos as a hobby on your own time. You do? Yeah, the YouTube channel has like 5 subscribers. One of them is my son one of them was my son, Teddy. Yeah, sure, if you want to subscribe, that would just make me all giddy inside. I, I subscribed. Um, anyway, um, fun fact, though, they didn't use chairs in those days. Uh, people reclined at table. They would actually lie down on pillows and cushions and stuff. And so tables were a lot lower to the ground, and, um, and it did not look uh, like people sitting there. And then, of course, there's the old joke that um, all of the people are sitting on the same side of the table in that painting there, and uh, nobody's sitting with their back to the viewer. But that's just Leonardo da Vinci's depiction of um, The Last Supper, and there's some cool artsy stuff in there that we're not going to talk about. But yeah, so instead of drawing The Last Supper on the board, I let Leonardo da Vinci draw it for me, and he probably did a better job. (laughs) Um, So yeah, Jesus adds to the meal. We already talked about he um, the Passover meal includes unleavened bread and wine as part of the the liturgy of the Passover meal, um, but Jesus adds to that uh, the words of institution, where he gives um, the sacraments of the altar uh, by, uh, by saying, take eat, this is my body, take drink, this is my blood. And, um, and we don't have time to discuss the sacrament of the altar. That's a whole unit in uh, next year's confirmation class for those of you who are in your first year this year. Um, next year, you'll get to learn all about Holy Communion and uh, the forgiveness of sins that is offered to uh, those who take it. Uh, you second-year students should have learned that last year. At the end of the meal, um, Jesus has an interaction with Peter. In the interest of time, we're not going to read it. Um, but basically, Jesus says that tonight, all of you will abandon me. And Peter says something to the effect of, not I, Lord. I would never abandon you. I would give my life for you. And Jesus famously says, Peter, by the time the rooster crows tonight, you will have denied me three times. And uh, Peter's not too thrilled to hear that, but, uh, you know, it's, you know, feels a bit deflated. But uh, we don't really know what Peter said in response to that, but uh, he probably uh, didn't think that was going to happen. But then, um, note number three there, the Garden of Gethsemane. Darn it, I erased my picture too soon. If you look on your map, you will find the Garden of Gethsemane Um, outside of Jerusalem on what I assume is the east. I'm just going to call that the east. Um, I think that is actually right now that I look at it, because the temple, I think, is on the east side of Jerusalem. But in any case, um, you see the number three there, that that fancy word that starts with a G is called Gethsemane. Um, So you you can pronounce all the letters, but uh, a lot of times people just say Gethsemane or something. But yeah, that's uh, that's on the mountain on the other side of the valley from Jerusalem, uh, the Mount of Olivet. So there's um, there's an olive garden there. They have uh, bottomless bottomless breadsticks and uh, good pasta. But, um, uh, yeah. So uh, so that's where Jesus goes and he prays there. Um, who wants to read Luke 22 verse 39 to 53? Addison. Yep. Let's give Addison our attention, please. Okay. 39 to 53. <laughs> and he came out and went as was his custom to 
the Mount of Olives and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Keep going. Oh. While he was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading him. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. Very good. So Jesus prays, and as he prays, he sweats, and his sweat becomes like drops of blood. This is a real condition that happens to people who are under extreme stress. Um, your blood vessels, as they go through your body, get smaller and smaller because they have to feed like every one of your cells with blood, and the smallest blood vessels are called capillaries. And, um, and when you're under extreme stress, your blood pressure rises very, very high and very quickly, and it causes your capillaries to begin to burst because there's just too much pressure and those teeny tiny little hoses that are carrying blood through your body. And, um, and the, the little bit of blood that bursts from your capillaries mixes with your sweat, and, um, and it looks like you're sweating drops of blood. So Jesus was in agony is the word the text uses, I think. Um, that's a pretty good word, if not an understatement. Elliot? So you're telling me that Jesus kind of exploded on the inside of him, stress. Well, exploding is a bit much. But uh, yes, on a very, very small scale, there were vessels in Jesus' body that were exploding from stress. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not like his heart exploded. Um, your, your, your cardiovascular system is pretty robust. Um, but, uh, but in the tiniest little capillaries, yeah, elevated blood pressure can cause those to burst. And, uh, and the blood mixes with your sweat, and that's what you get there. Um, Jesus asked that God would take, his, take this cup from me. What does that mean? You going back to communion, maybe? What does that mean, take this cup from me? What is the cup? The, is it the cup that has the blood in it? You're kind of on the right track, yeah. So it's not a direct reference to communion, um, but it's not unrelated. Uh, Jesus frequently refers to his suffering as a cup that he must drink. Um, so if you imagine um, the wrath of God, the sins of the world, um, the, the suffering of death, you know, in liquid form poured out into a cup, Jesus has to drink this cup until it is empty. So it's kind of a, a vivid image. Uh, it's not a literal cup. Um, but as a vivid image of what Jesus has to do, he has to take all of this into himself as like a drink, and, um, and it, will, it will destroy him, and he knows this, and he doesn't want it to happen. So he prays that God would take this cup from him, um, but he ends his prayer, as all of our prayers should end, in submission to God's will. And that's your memory verse. I, I used a different translation because it's easier to understand. Um, but Jesus prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. So Jesus says, God, this is what I want, um, but I'm not here for what I want. I'm here to serve you. So um, not my will, but thine be done. Very good. Naturally, we're um, getting close to out of time, so we're not going to get to read directly anymore. But um, number four uh, takes place that night. So it's on Maundy Thursday, we call it. Don't put your stuff away. We got five minutes. Um, okay, well, 
Um, we call it Maundy Thursday uh, is when Jesus institutes Holy Communion and he goes out to pray that night in the garden. And it's probably right around midnight where he is captured by Judas and his, his gang and is brought to, um, is brought to the, uh, the, the Sanhedrin Council. Um, the Sanhedrin is the fancy name given to the governors of the Jewish temple faith in Jerusalem. Um, they didn't own the city, right? The Romans did, but they still kind of had their own little system of government. It was limited, which frustrated them a lot, um, but they did have uh, soldiers in the temple. So like they actually had the ability to use force to an extent, kind of a private security uh, kind of thing. And anyway, the Jewish uh, leaders um, have a, a trial by night, which is actually against Old Testament law, but they do it anyway. They have a trial wherein they accuse Jesus of blasphemy, that is, of disrespecting the things of God, and they find him guilty of blasphemy, that he claims to be the Son of God, and yet he's obviously just a man. And, um, and what they're really afraid of is that he is going to get a following and raise an army and try to oppose Rome, and Rome will utterly destroy them, right? Um, and so the, the Jewish leaders don't like how little power they have under Rome, but they're afraid that if Jesus raises an army, that Rome is going to come and crush them and take away what little power they have. And they're right. Um, it do, it's not Jesus who does it, but it's only another 40 years, and there is an uprising in Israel, and the Romans come, Romans come and just uh, destroy the city of Jerusalem, uh, destroy the temple, and scatter the Jews living there. But anyway, um, so the, uh, the Pharisees and uh, the, the, the Sanhedrin, the ruling council, rules that Jesus is guilty of blasphemy. He must die. Problem! They're not allowed to kill people. Um, I said they have limited power under the Roman government, and it turns out the death penalty is something that the Roman government reserves for itself. So in order to do the death penalty against this blasphemer, the Jews have to, um, have to get approval from the Roman governor. Who knows the name of the Roman governor? Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate. That's right. That's why in our creed we say Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. Um, to link him to a, a, a historical figure. Um, who actually, Pontius Pilate, um, was probably not too thrilled at being woken up at 2 in the morning uh, to deal with uh, some religious dispute. Um, but he hears their case. Um, he hears Jesus. He thinks Jesus might be a little wonky as a, like a religious guy, but he's not dangerous. He's not promoting violence or, or throwing off Roman oppression. Um, you know, he calls himself the king of the Jews, but he says, my kingdom is not of this world. So Pilate is like, look, guys, I mean, I know you're not a big fan, but I find nothing wrong with him. I don't think we should execute him. Um, but the, the Sanhedrin and the leaders of the Jews, they're stirring up a mob and, and um, you know, by now the sun is breaking and there's a growing crowd demanding that Jesus, this rabble rouser, be crucified. And eventually um, Pontius Pilate gets kind of scared of the crowd and he ceremonially washes his hands in front of them, which is to say, I am innocent of this man's blood. My hands are clean, but you do what you want with him. And uh, so he, he authorized the execution of Jesus by crucifixion. So, um, so let's see here. Actually, yeah, that, um, oh, there is one other thing. Number four there is um, uh, while Jesus is undergoing this trial, it's inside of a building. Peter, uh, the, the, most of the disciples have run away from Jesus after he was captured in the garden. Peter actually follows Jesus at a distance and when Jesus goes into the building, Peter sits down with a group of servants and such uh, who are warming themselves by a fire. And it is there by that fire that somebody recognizes him. And it says, hey, you were one of the guys in the garden with Jesus. And Peter, scared for his life, um, his whole world is turning upside down. Peter says, no, I wasn't. I don't even know the guy. And, uh, and somebody else is like, yeah, you were with him. I remember you. And he says, no, I, I, I don't even know who this guy is. And another one's like, your accent, you're from Galilee. Jesus is from Galilee. We don't get a lot of Galileans in these parts. And uh, at that point, Peter starts to curse and swear. And he's like, oh, I swear, I don't know this guy at all. And uh, that's when the rooster crows. And, uh, and very dramatically, Jesus is taken out of the building about that time, and he makes eye contact with Peter. And Peter realizes what he has just done, and he leaves, in, um, in, in, he leaves weeping. He's just, uh, yeah mortified at his own evil 
Judas also is mortified at his own evil. Um, apparently, he didn't think this whole selling out the Savior thing through. Um, but Jesus, or uh, excuse me, I keep saying Jesus. Judas um, actually commits suicide in his guilt. Yeah. So Peter holds out for forgiveness and is eventually forgiven by Jesus and reinstated as his, as his disciple. Um, there was similar hope for Judas if he would have uh, held out for it, but he despaired uh, and uh, despaired even of his own life. So that is a, a tragedy there in Judas. But we will go ahead and end today with Jesus being declared innocent by Pilate and yet uh, Pilate ultimately authorizing the Jews to, uh, to crucify Jesus. Uh, let's close with prayer and then uh, I'll uh, go over there and pass out graded papers. Uh, we pray together Luther's evening prayer. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all of my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. All right, your homework is over there, as are some graded papers, so uh, make your way.